in their Advent devotionals for Calvary, both Jacob Gertz and Christine Zeiler reminded us of the beloved scene in A Charlie Brown Christmas, when Charlie Brown, exasperated with his friends, exclaims, isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Of course, Linus responds by saying, sure, Charlie Brown. The lights dim and he takes center stage. He begins to recite Luke 2. And as he gets to the part about the angels visiting the shepherds in the fields, and he exclaims, do not be afraid, Linus drops his security blanket, almost without even thinking about it, as if he is dropping in that moment his own fears. Of all the characters thus far in our Advent series, the shepherds are the only ones who relate like Linus does, because they drop everything and go. They leave the security blanket of their flocks and fields and go to Bethlehem to see. Now, they are terrified, as Luke tells us, but their fears do not halt their faith or their curiosity. I wonder if their reaction is so immediate because unlike Zechariah, Joseph, and Mary, who, as we've seen over the past three weeks, received highly personal messages directly related to their lives, this message came out of the blue for the shepherds. And really, it had nothing to do with them or their lives, or so they thought. What did a baby born in a stable in Bethlehem to people who they didn't know have anything to do with them? Lowly shepherds in the fields. Gabriel Powell writes, you know, we're so familiar with the Christmas story that we've lost its shock factor. Anybody just now kind of tune out as Luke 2 was being read? We especially lose our shock factor, he says, when it comes to the shepherds. We see shepherd figurines in stores and front lawns. We sing about them. Our children dress up like them. We're confronted with the image of shepherds all during December. But do we ever reflect on why they are in the story? Or why the angels reserved their most magnificent announcement of Jesus' birth for the least likely recipients. You see, shepherding is actually one of the oldest professions in the world. We read about it even in Genesis 4, Abel is called a keeper of the sheep. Throughout biblical history, significant people were experienced shepherds, right? Jacob and his sons, Moses and David. Shepherding is a prominent theme in scripture, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And in the New Testament, in John 10, Jesus says, I am the good. I lay down my life for my sheep. And so in many respects to us, you know, 2,000 plus years after the fact, it may seem like shepherding is a noble profession. But it wasn't. Shepherds had a hard time maintaining religious purity as the Pharisees defined it. They could not keep the Sabbath because sheep needed constant protection. And shepherds spent most of their time in the fields, away from society, and they had no influence to speak of. In modern terms, we might think of them as day laborers in factories or fields, mostly unnoticed by those in power. Shepherds were the lower class of society. So imagine if God hired you to plan the announcement of the savior of the world. Who would you tell? It probably wouldn't make sense to go to Caesar or Herod because they would destroy any threat to their thrones. But wouldn't it make sense to go to those who had favorable influence over others? 
wouldn't it make sense to declare the arrival of the Messiah to those who had already studied and known about his prophetic coming, you know, their entire lives? That would make sense to us, I think, from a human perspective, but God's perspective is quite different than ours. And God chooses shepherds who did not have circles of friends, no LinkedIn accounts or thousands and millions of Twitter followers, no platforms or pulpits from which to speak. Why did God choose to make the most spectacular announcement to the group least able to spread it? Well, the answer is pretty obvious. In announcing the birth of Jesus to the shepherds, God gives hope to the least of these, the lowest group in society, the ones who were considered the farthest from God, the ones that nobody cared about. And people didn't care about shepherds because they were never around them. They didn't know them. It is so easy to stigmatize and otherize people who we do not know or who we are not around, isn't it? See, the shepherds were considered not worthy for God in first century culture because they were ceremonially unclean. Think about it. They're around manure and animals. And although they provided animals to be used in temple worship, they were excluded from the temple. Now, there were rituals that they could have done to make them acceptable for worship, but that would require them to leave their sheep, which they couldn't do and wouldn't do. And I remind you at this time that worship was so closely associated with the temple, and the temple was literally where the presence of God was. Which is why God, coming as a baby, as a person, to dwell with and among the people is so powerful. Because God is now located in a relational person and not in an institution or a building. It's the beginning of God's plan for God to be located within us as the Holy Spirit. And the shepherds were the first folks to be a part of this plan. They were the group, always on the outside, looking in. And God chose them to let us know that no one is beyond the realm of God's love. Those we think are least important in our lives might just have a remarkable message from God that we don't have yet and that we need to hear from them because the message only makes sense if it comes from their mouths. The reason I love the shepherds is because of the immediate action-oriented response that they have. They were clearly not Baptists. They did not form a committee to discuss the significance of the angel's announcement. Or they didn't do what I do and make a pros and cons list of, you know, should we go to Bethlehem, should we not go? They simply said, let's go see. And this is the invitation that is still given to us today. We have the same invitation that the angels gave the shepherds to go and see. And we can remain where we are, or we can take God up on this invitation. And it's not an invitation about religion. It's an invitation about coming into relationship with God. This is something Jesus did his whole life. Think about how he called his disciples, follow me, he said. He invited them to come to him when they were weary or carrying heavy burdens, and he would give them rest. He said to the children, let the little children come to me and do not stop them, for to such as these does the kingdom of God belong. And in scripture, every time we see this invitation of Jesus inviting us to come to him, people are changed. And this even happens when he's just a baby. 
Luke says, after seeing Jesus, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. The shepherds were changed because they had experienced Jesus. Think about it. To tell everyone about what they had experienced, they had to leave their sheep. That is very unshepherdly. They also had to find their voice, telling everyone what happened. And remember, these are the people in society who people thought, you know, they can't have an experience of God. They can't go into the temple, so how can they speak of God? And yet, here are the shepherds proclaiming the good news and claiming it as if it was their own, because it was. And not only were they changed, so was everyone who heard their message. Luke writes, and all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. You know, I love the fact that our Advent Fear Not series ends with the shepherds. Because in a lot of ways, I think we are probably the most like them. We might be wondering what the birth of Jesus has to do with us. You know, why it matters. You might be wondering today, how do I fit into this ancient story from 2,000 plus years ago? On a deeper level, maybe you feel like the one who is the outcast, the lowly, the marginalized, the forgotten. And if you do, the message for you today is do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you, you who are fear-filled, you who are unloved, you who are an outcast. I am bringing you the good news of great joy for all people that a savior is born for you. Now the sign that this good news is for you is as ordinary as a newborn baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. The sign is not some mysterious or mystical experience that happens in the sky just once in a flash with those angels and shepherds. You know, the kind of experience where you have to be in the right place at the right time or you miss it. No, this sign is a very real person made of flesh and bone who you can touch and hear and see and feel just as sure as I was holding little Harvey today. So if you are one who's been waiting for a sign from God in order to believe in God, I suggest you go find a newborn baby. I'm sure Katie and Tyler would let you hold little Harvey today. But see the miracle of life that is born again and again and again into our lives, changing us forever. And the birth of a baby is a miracle that requires growth and learning and nurturing. And that's what I love about the symbolism of God coming in the form of a babe. You don't just see the Son of God once and then understand and believe. It is a process of growth and learning, and maturing, and questioning, and believing, and going through that cycle all over again and again. And it's a process that lasts our whole lives long. The shepherds are adults when they're asked by the angels to jump into a story that they thought they had nothing to do with. They could have said when the angels left, whoa, that was weird. Did you see what I saw? Yeah, we're clearly lacking in sleep. That was a crazy dream. Shepherds, you know, could have just gone about their business and not gone to Bethlehem. They could have still believed the myth that nothing special ever happens to them, that they're not crucial in God's story. But they took a risk, and they went. They followed the voice of God, not letting their fears get the best of them. And in taking that risk, they were changed. Is there something in your life holding you back from jumping into the fullness of God's story for you? Do you feel like you don't belong? Or do you wonder what your role is, perhaps in this new season of life? Do you wonder if your life will ever change or if it will ever be different than it is now? If this is you, if you are like the shepherds, then I invite you just to try to put your fears on hold for a day or so, maybe a week, 
and explore what God might be saying to you. What message would you allow yourself to hear from God if you weren't afraid of what that message was? Or what it would ask you to do? Or where it would ask you to go? Or who it might ask you to be in relationship with? Or what it might ask you to give up or let go of, or take on, or adapt to. If you allow yourself to hear that message that many of us are afraid to hear, then what would it look like for you to share that with others? And take all of your fears and doubts and questionings and wonderings and just let them be. And not let them hold you back from seeing the fullness of life that God has for you which is what the shepherds saw when they saw the baby Jesus in the manger. They not only saw a baby boy with his whole life ahead of him, almost like a mirror, they saw their own reflection in this baby. They saw their own lives ahead of them with a whole new way of relating to God, almost like a rebirth for themselves. Time stood still, in other words for the shepherds, because they allowed themselves to be a part of a story they never dreamed they could be a part of. They stopped selling themselves short and they found their belonging in the presence of the Christ child. Now, some of you may not feel like you're on the outside of life right now. Things may be going swimmingly for you. Maybe you have little to no fear about fitting in with where your life is right now or what your purpose is or about how your faith is going. And so if that is you, if you're in a place of little to no fear, God bless you, you're wonderful. And your role is this, to identify who the shepherds are in your midst who need to be invited into the story of Christ, the story of hope, peace, joy, and love, the story of light and grace, the story that will change their lives just as it has changed yours. Because the shepherds do not find out about the Christ child without the messengers who come and tell them. What if you are the messenger? The one who was called to say, fear not, to someone in your life. Could be a family member or a friend. Someone who's going through a difficult decision. Someone who has asked you to pray for them, but you sense there's something more or deeper going on that you could help with. Your message in these cases is, fear not, Emmanuel, for God is with us, right? You're not in this alone. God is with us. Or maybe the message of fear not is on a larger scale. Maybe you see the shepherds as the kids who don't have friends in your school. Maybe those who are bullied. Maybe it's some people you know that do not have legal status in the United States that are literally on the outskirts of our society. Welcome not only in the temple, but but not anywhere. Maybe it's the people who are without a home right now who you see in need on the street corners and even within our own church. Maybe it's the sick and vulnerable who don't have family with them or the neighbor down the street who can't get out. Maybe it's other people of faith who believe differently than you and you just don't know how to have a meaningful conversation with them about things that matter. Maybe it's some of your coworkers that complain all the time And you can tell that they're missing something in in their life, some kind of joy. Whatever it is, whatever person or group of people that you see on the margins of society or on the margins of your own life, you are called to be the messenger that says, fear not, for Emmanuel, God is with us. Jesus came into the world to show us how to love. And I don't know about you, but I wonder, when will we ever learn that love casts out fear? That love is the answer. When will we learn that our fears of the other, the other idea, the other party, the other religion, the other race, the other person, you pick your other, 
When will we realize that that will be gone when we start to see the world as Jesus does and we start to love others unconditionally? There is perhaps no greater message for us on this candle of love Sunday than to remember that Jesus came not only to give us life, but to show us how to love. As we wrap up this Advent series and move into Christmas Eve, when the one who is love incarnate bursts through the veil of our fears once again, I challenge us all to take this fear not message to heart. Either receive it for yourself and know that you are part of God's story and that God is alive and at work in your life in ways you can't even imagine or think of right now. And when you forget that, just look up Zechariah and Joseph and Mary and the shepherds. Whatever it is that you're anxious about or afraid about, remember that God is with you and we are with you. And as Jesus said in his most famous sermon, who of you can add a single hour to your life by worrying? Or if you have received this message of fear not for yourself, then start proclaiming it to the world. Our world needs to hear fear not. Shouted from the mountaintops, yes, but also whispered one-on-one. -on -one. You know, Linus does drop his security blanket when he's reciting Luke 2. But if you watch the whole clip, you notice that as he leaves to exit the stage and go back into his life, he picks his security blanket back up with him. That is to say, he did not just drop his fears in that one moment and they were gone. Like Linus, we consciously pick up our fears, let them go. Pick up our fears and let them go. And that is why, whether you need this message for yourself or whether you proclaim it to the world, that it never gets old. Fear not, for Emmanuel, God is with us. Amen.